you found this skeleton, how would you tell people that you found this skeleton? You first, you first, you first, how would you decide? Well, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. After what has been a rather overwhelming and positive reception to my humble little speculative evolution project, it's time to see what was submitted and accepted for Phase 1, then set the stage for Phase 2. I want to thank everyone who submitted organisms, especially those who did so after I stopped taking new entries. You came up with some very inventive creatures, and if your creature didn't make it into the project, I promise you that it's not because it was bad. In fact, I would suggest you could form your own speculative project because I want as many as we can get. Well, let's see what was in phase one that I didn't get to in the first video, because it hadn't been added yet. First up is Joneno. Joneno is a photosynthetic organism related to Bossio, which attaches to rocks in shallow waters. Joneno consists of soft trapezoidal sections that connect to one another at ends. Up to three sections can attach at each end, although occasionally two sections will fuse. These sections anchor it to the rock, conduct photosynthesis, and absorb nutrients from the water. It forms spherical buds that intake nutrients from attached sections. These serve as reproductive organs. Each section is roughly 2 to 2.3 inches or 5 to 6 centimeters from end to end. Buds have a diameter of 0.47 inches or 1.2 centimeters. Mature bud diameters range from 0.8 to 0.95 inches or 2.1 to 2.4 centimeters. Photosynthesis is done in an identical manner to Fossio. The sections of mature buds produce a strong adhesive that sticks them to the rock. Growing sections do not produce this. Joneno reproduces asexually with buds, which form and mature on the parent before being released into the current. Once these buds land on a hard surface, such as a rock, they will stick to it due to the adhesive they produce. Mature buds are regarded as stage one. Once the buds have landed, they will begin to flatten and expand with material from the center. Once this has finished, it will be about 2.48 to 2.67 inches or 6.3 to 6.8 centimeters across, while being no taller than 0.1 inch or 3 millimeters. This is regarded as stage 2. Stage 3 is the formation of a trapezoidal segment off the circular body and is considered maturity for the organism. It takes approximately 79 hours for buds to reach maturity. The growth time from landing to stage 3 is roughly 14 hours. Sections take 31 hours to grow for established organisms, while ones that have just begun stage 3 take 57 hours to grow. This is assuming optimal conditions. Joneno is found on rocks throughout the shallow waters of Almaisha. It serves as a producer, although it is less important to the food chain than Basio. Scientific name? Phytofungus trapezus. Origin or ancestry? Retinal phyta. Next up is the fractal tree. Fractal trees are an unusual organism and are not closely related to any other macroscopic life on Almaisha. They are radiotrophic sessile creatures that live in the depths of the water near hydrothermal vents, soaking up ionizing radiation from volcanic vents nearby. They also absorb minerals from the water that they use to store energy and grow in physical bulk. Fractal trees are one of the most common forms of earlier radiotrophic life found on Almaisha. Each tree has a stem that is anchored to the seafloor. This stem has two thick, paddle-like flat leaves that grow from the stem. Each leaf grows two branches. Each branch then grows two leaves, and so on. A typical specimen is one meter tall. The leaves on fractal trees function as beta-voltaic cells. Zinc oxides form as a thin film on one side of mica-like phyllosilicates. Uranium oxides would be deposited on the other. These sheets produce a steady electric current, powering their chemical reactions. The balloon-like bladders of fluoropolymers trap the hydrogen produced by chemical reactions in its leaves, so that the neutral buoyance is maintained. The stem and branches of fractal trees are composed of thin strands of copper. These strands are coated by fluoropolymer and wind around the core composed of magnetite. The larval stage of the tree is a pair of leaves searching for a new source of radiation. When the fractal tree grows to maturity, small branches that grow buoyant detach themselves from their parent leaf. The detached leaves use their electric charge to whip their stem. This powers them through the water. Eventually, the leaves will detect a source of radiation. They will head towards the source, affix their stem to the sea bottom, and start growing. The time to reach maturity depends on the resources where the larva settles. It can take anything from a few months to centuries. Fractal trees need iron, copper, sulfur, copper, silica, aluminum silicates, aluminum oxides, zinc oxides, as well as one or more forms of uranium ore. They prefer habitats where aluminum phosphate is present. Fractal trees use it to trap the xenon produced by the radioactive decay of uranium ore. This prevents the poisoning of the nuclear chain reaction. Fractal trees are radiotrophs. That means they are autotrophs that use ionizing radiation to power their metabolic functions. Fractal tree larvae use their paddle-like leaves to sense external sources of ionizing radiation and will swim towards it. They can also sense when they are not neutrally buoyant and will adjust themselves accordingly. Scientific name? 
Radiophilus geminus. Origin, Radiotropho. Average height, 1 meter or 3 feet 3 inches. Next is the filter globe. Filter globes are quadriradial filter feeders from ancient Almaisha. The arrangement and form of their eyes and feeding tendrils clearly aligns them with the pentaradial feather barrels, although they are a bit simpler in form. Pictured, a ballon of filter globes benefiting from a full moon spawning of feather barrels in a quiet and calm bay on ancient Almaisha, approximately 480 million years ago. Filter globes are small radial symmetrical feeders with an air bubble on top of their posterior surface. They have eight tentacles, which have seven small pinkish hair-like protrusions that grab their prey. They can move their tentacles up and down, and they ingest their prey by moving their tentacles to the mouth located below their heads, which brings them to the creature's stomach. They can use the water inside of them to slowly move around, if needed, by removing it through their gills located near the air bubble. They have four eyes located on each side of the anterior end. They are simple, but are able to detect differences in the amount of light, sun color, and they have depth perception. Their skin is sensitive and has a purple color, and their blood moves around in small canals located all over it. They have four heart-like organs located above the stomach, which help pump the blood. They also excrete unwanted substances through their mouth. They have an agglomeration of neurons located just above their hearts. It's a simple brain-like structure which helps them survive. They reproduce through their mouth and produce gametes depending on their sex. They have small discs above their head that are also filled with air. These discs are used to help the creatures stay still and straight. Filter globes reproduce sexually and are hermaphrodites. Their method of reproduction is through broadcast spawn, which happens after one year of maturation, and then annually. Filter globes have three distinct life stages. The first one is a sphere of cells created after conception. After they geminate, they will be almost exactly like their parents, but will have a darker color and won't be able to dash through the water if needed, because the muscles near their gills have yet to grow. Their diet will be mostly the same from the adult stage, but they will try to eat a lot more as they need to grow quickly to have better chances of survival. The last one is the adult stage, where the creature is fully mature and ready to mate. Filter globes live in cool waters. They tend to stay closer to the poles, but can sometimes be seen closer to the tropics. These creatures tend to live in groups of at least five individuals. This group of filter globes is called a ballon. These ballons are made so that there will be a higher chance of success on reproduction. The larvae of filter globes will try to reach the closest ballon in sight as soon as they reach maturity, and will try to remain in the same ballon for the rest of their lives. Scientific name, Filtros globus elegans. Origin, Xenoradiata. Next, we have Diomisa. Diomisa ekplixi is a tiny soft-bodied generalist and scavenger. This is a creature composed of two tagmata on its body. The first possesses an orifice on the ventral side situated in the center, leading to a mouth where it ingests matter using two sets of appendages to move the sediment in search of any edible material. It also possesses four light-sensitive receptors located on the top of the tagma. Each pair of receptor connects to a side of a simple brain that is situated above the stomach and behind the reproductive organs. The second tagma possesses eight limbs that are powered by valves. The second tagma possesses eight limbs that are powered by valves that inject hemolymph into them that, with the movement of the muscle fibers, create a pump-like action allowing circulation of blood through the body. At the back of the segment, there are four sets of spiracles, each leading to a set of internal gills that do the gas exchange with the aid of leg movement. Right above the mouth, there is a chamber that possesses gametes. When it's time to reproduce, the creatures will lift the first tagma, open the valve, and inject into the water thousands of gametes, releasing them all at once. If it's successful, then the larvae will become part of the zooplankton, floating around until they grow large enough to descend to the bottom. Each small tentacle is lined with chemoreceptors and sensory receptors that aid it in its search for food. Whenever it has found something edible, it will then use the appendage to drag sediment and dead matter towards the orifice. Once it has ingested enough matter, it will close the orifice by wrapping the appendages over it and closing the valve that leads to the gamete chamber before digestion. After digesting, they will excrete the waste by using muscle fibers to rapidly squeeze the stomach to eject it out in a pellet-like form. Origin: Paleotagmata. Average length, 10 millimeters or 0.39 inches. The rose crown is a basal stephanozoan from 480 million years ago on Almayusha, here pictured at times 100 magnification. They are omnivorous members of the zooplankton found throughout the upper layers of the water column worldwide. Stephanozoan anatomy consists of an octoradial unsegmented body. It is unclear how to apply terms like ventral, dorsal, anterior, or posterior to stephanozoans, and so proximal and distal are used for tentacles, while medial and lateral are used for most other things. There is no brain or even distinct ganglia, but there is a nerve net similar to that found in cnidarians. The body consists of a bell, a central stomach, and three sets of tentacles. Inside the bell are eight gonads, each of which produce both spermatozoa and ova. The stomach is surmounted by a nephridium. The three sets of tentacles include 16 motive tentacles, 32 feeding tentacles, and 8 jaw tentacles. 
The motive tentacles are used to swim. The feeding tentacles are chemo and touch receptors and are used to snare food with a sticky secretion. The jaw tentacles grab food particles from the feeding tentacles and move it to the stomach. Rose crowns are small enough to not need a circulatory system and are morphologically a coelomate. Stephanozoans are diploid creatures. When they encounter each other, they meet tentacle end to tentacle end and exchange gametes in the space between them. The ovum will develop into a sphere of cells and the blastopore will develop. The jaw tentacles will develop by cells folding around the blastopore. All this occurs without feeding, and the total volume is equal to that of the original ovum. At this point, the organism will start feeding, primarily on single-celled organisms, and it will grow until it reaches a predetermined number of cells, dependent on species. They can be found worldwide. The rose crown cannot detect light, but its feeding tentacles are sensitive to scent and direct the creature towards food. Scientific name? Stephanos rosier. Origin? Stephanozoa. Lifespan? 50 local days. Average length? 0.3 millimeters. Well, now it's time for phase two. In phase two, we advance 10 million years. Increased volcanism and solar activity have warmed Almaisha up a bit, melting the ice that had existed earlier and leaving only a small polar ice cap over the far northern reaches of Arctica. The continents are all lifeless above water, but in the oceans, life has been evolving rapidly. The big trigger for this is that some creatures have adapted to become predators who, rather than simply eating tiny worms or zooplankton, instead will attack large targets. The large stretches of shallow coastal water also mean large intertidal zones, and organisms have adapted to these regions to escape predation. This has resulted in the evolution of swifter swimming, venom, claws, shells, spines, and better senses. This is where you come in. Please submit your creatures for this phase. Try not to make things that are too big or advanced. If it's over a meter or so, or it can fly, or something like that, it's probably not going to make it. Also, your creature must evolve from something established in phase 1, and it must use that creature's anatomy as its basis. If you just say that something is related to, say, a feather barrel, but it has no similarities to the Phase 1 feather barrel, then it's not going to work. Finally, please submit a map showing where your creature lives. There is a map on the World Anvil. Although creatures from Phase 1 can be assumed to have more or less global distributions unless stated otherwise in their descriptions, creatures in Phase 2 will have a more defined area. To keep as up-to-date as possible, check the World Anvil, as it updates far more often than the channel, and if you have an idea but it contradicts what's already there, I'll either have to reject it or ask you to change the parts that are contradictory. Well, let's see what we already have for Phase 2, because Gutsik Gibbon has been very busy coming up with creatures for Almaisha, and I let her get in some extra Phase 2 stuff while I wasn't looking. First up for Phase 2 are the Chloropseudopods, a derived group of phytozoans. They derive most of their energy from photosynthesis, but get most of their mass from trace nutrients from filter feeding via the water column. Chloropseudopods have six feet leading to a thin stalk, which then blossoms into a mantle. The mantle is the primary photosynthetic surface, and in its center is an eye cup made up of clusters of opsins. Towards one end of the eye cup, two tendrils emerge, homologous to the sensory stalks of Cecilia. These have some secondary fronds for photosynthesis, and are tipped in hair-like filaments that catch microbes and digest them externally to provide the chloropseudopod with additional nutrients it cannot get from photosynthesis alone. The eye cup on top of the organism can detect light and darkness, as well as the general direction of light. During the day, this is used to track the sun with its hood. But when light levels fall sufficiently, chloropseudopods begin filter feeding with their feeding tendrils. Ancestor? Cecilia. Scientific name? Chloropseudopod inexpectans. Origin? Phytozoa. Next up is the Infermignathid. Infermignathids are a group of derived xenosigmatons. Tagnosis has occurred since the original gray segmented creature, with a reduction in segments to six, including a consolidation of eye spots in the most cranial segment. The primary filter feeding opening has experienced a series of mutations so that hard plates have covered most of the organism's body. The primary filter feeding opening has experienced a series of mutations so that the hard plates that cover most of the organism's body are loosely connected by column-styled muscles. This allows it to guillotine its prey in a very basal and almost placoderm fashion. The strength is very weak, as the muscle attachments are somewhat fragile, but no organisms at this time have evolved plates or skin tough enough to withstand the bite of this creature. Its eyes consist of three collections of opsum clusters in slight depressions in the skull. The organism secretes a mucus that protects the eyes from acidity and salinity changes in the ocean. Its paddles have been reduced to primary and secondary pairs in the 2, 3, and 4, 5 tagmata. Functional gills have conglomerated in four pockets on the second and third tagma. The organism hunts by gently swimming over the substrate and using its non-functional and rigid gill arches on its last tagma to feel for prey. It can quickly whip around if prey is found, using its mouth parts to seize its meal. The eyes are angled upward to detect predators, and thus this animal cannot see below its body. Scientific name, Infirbignathus canus. Origin, Xenosegmata. 
Then we have the proboscognathids. Proboscognathids are a sister group to the infirmignathids. They hunt essentially anything they can get their jaws around, using a combination of vision and tactile sensation to find prey. They skim the seafloor looking for disturbances in the sand, and then swoop close and try to force the burrowing prey out with its adapted fore paddles. It is highly active, requiring constant, efficient gas exchange, which is why it has come to use a fringe of gills known as frills around each tagma. This particular species is a derived member of the proboscignatha, as the ma proboscis have adapted for structural soundness, meaning they have lost the ability to act as proper proboscis. The proboscis that line the maw are rigid and jointed at the midsection, allowing for captured prey to be drawn into the waiting maw. The closing motion for closing around its meal is rapid and works somewhat like a modern hymenopteran's mechanism for flight. This makes the reopening somewhat taxing, so it must be certain it wants to expend energy closing the trio. Proboscognathan's eyes sit on stalks which allow it to scan for prey in multiple directions. Similar to the infirmignathans, the proboscognathans have three eyes made up of three opsin clusters each. They are capable of distinguishing light from dark and spotting movement. Scientific name, Proboscognatha crypsis. Origin, Xenosegmata. Last up, we have the Phytopinnipeds. Phytopinnipeds are a surface-dwelling, filter-feeding phytozoan. It is so named because of the fact that, of the ancestral phytozoan swimming appendages, two have moved forward, and the rearmost have fused into a paddle. This is vaguely reminiscent of seals on Earth. Phytopinnipeds retain the ovoid body and forward tendrils of Cecilia but it has modified the swimming appendages into paired stabilizers and a single swimming fluke. It also has a tall leaf-like structure on its back, used as the primary photosynthetic structure. The forward tendrils are a filter-feeding apparatus. Stiff bristles extend medially, and when plankton are caught on them, they are digested externally for extra nutrients, minerals, and vitamins. The ventral surface is studded with sharp barbs, each of which sits below a pouch full of toxic chemicals to deter predators who may attack from below. There are also anterior paired eye spots. Phytopinnipeds have a haplodiploid life cycle. The most conspicuous are those described here and are the diploid phase. They expel spores from a ventral gonopore, which grow into haploid organisms that greatly resemble basal phytozoans, with no leaf and multiple inefficient propulsion appendages. These live only a short while and live primarily to meet another such haploid creature, use their sensory tendrils to transfer isogamous gametes between them, and then die. Each mating can create tens of thousands of fertilized spores, which will grow into diploid adults. They start as phytoplankton, and the lucky ones grow into large, for the time, phytozoans, who primarily inhabit the deep waters where predators are less common and there is less chance of being beached. While most of their energy is derived from photosynthesis, phytopinnipeds depend on filter feeding for vital vitamins and minerals. During the day, phytopinnipeds are mostly inactive, only turning to keep the broad face of their leaf facing the sun. During the night, they begin actively swimming to catch phytoplankton on their bristles. They are found worldwide in deep, open water. The eye spots of phytopinnipeds are simple and do little more than regulate the circadian rhythm of the creature and allow it to face the sun for optimal photosynthesis. Ancestor, Cecilia. Scientific name, Viridia bestia natans. Origin, Phytozoa. Lifespan, 10 local years. Average height, 30.5 centimeters or 12 inches. Average length, 20 centimeters or 8 inches. Well, that's it for now. I'm really happy how quickly people have taken to this. When I started it, I thought it would just be me, Benthoven, Gutsy Gibbon, and maybe a couple of my patrons. But I've been getting lots of emails, and the fan discord has been very active discussing all sorts of details. So if you want to participate, join the fan discord server, which is linked below so you can talk to other fans about the project, and submit your creatures to me at the.dapper.dino.yt at gmail.com. If this is your first time on the channel and you enjoyed what you saw, please consider hitting the subscribe button and maybe even ringing the bell so that you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. Also, please remember to like this video and leave a comment as both of those really help this video reach a larger audience. And the larger the audience is, the more ideas we have coming in and the better creatures we get. I'll talk to you next time. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching. But before you go, I'd like to take some time to thank my patrons, especially my $20 and above patrons, Ian Chen, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, Bob Knob, the Evil Scotsman, and Benthoven. As you know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and my patrons give me much needed stability. If you'd like to join the team, there's a link in the description to my Patreon, which starts at $1. If you'd like, I also have a link to my Teespring store and an Amazon wishlist. Well,